All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and get underway here. I've got, as, as usual, a fair bit of material I want to try to get to, including some stuff from the previous lecture that we didn't quite get to, uh, and then just a few sort of the normal sort of updates and things. Um, this is uh, information that I sent in the email, I believe, yesterday uh, afternoon, and it was just about the group assignments for the upcoming MR lab. Um, again, if you have any problems or conflicts or whatever, just let me know, but let me know soon so we can try to accommodate that. Uh, we won't have other times available, but if a slot or uh, if a slot doesn't work or if you're um, at odds with your lab mates or something like this, uh, just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll make it work. Um, and generally, I sort of switch people around. If you're on the one and a half T, you're probably on a three T system. If you're early last time, you're late this time, just in fairness. But if there's a conflict, let me know. Uh, okay. And that's not that far away. Uh, and also then, I guess, related to the labs, I have the lab assignments, so let me forget. Um, they're in my bag. I'll put them here. Uh, I'll hand out the lab assignments at the end um, so you guys can get some feedback about how that went. Uh, and then related to that, Eric will be here at the end of lecture. He'll come in at kind of quarter till or something like that. Uh, we'll hand back the labs. If you have questions, he's the one that graded them, so you can sort of ask him directly. Um, and uh, if you have questions about the homework, which is due tonight, uh, mm -hmm. then you can ask him as well. I have a meeting right at three, so I can stick around until just maybe a few minutes before that, but then I've got to uh, head out as well. So uh, hopefully we're in good shape. Okay. So this is an expression that's really important for you guys to understand, and we're going to spend a little bit more time uh, thinking about it today. This is uh, basically the, what's often called, oftentimes called the MRI signal equation. There was actually a lot of steps and a lot of work and, and several assumptions that sort of got us to the point where we have an expression that's relatively simple uh, compared to how bad it could have been, I guess. Um, and the idea here, and you'll see, we'll make a substitution today as well, that uh, this information here is really all about the object, right? It's the state of the transverse magnetization at the time that we acquire the signal. And that's actually, that's basically our image, right? It's the representation of the underlying object in an image space, and it's colored by things like T1, and T2, and proton density, and so forth. And the signals that we acquire, uh, they, the, the magnitude, if you will, of the signal that we acquire depends on what K point, or where we are in K space, that particular, say, point in time. And uh, the magnitude of that particular uh, spatial frequency depends on you know, what the underlying object itself is, but also this spatial frequency encoding term here. And the spatial frequency encoding term uh, depends on uh, the k-space value, and, it's a, and, and, and then it will vary, of course, over space. We saw these plots of these sort of wave functions over space. Then the k-value itself is going to depend on the gradient, and the gradient is a function of time, so that it inherently depends on time as well. Um, at the end of the day, we don't care too much about sort of what the actual gradients are or exactly what point in time we are. We just care about the k vector or the k point that we're trying to acquire. And it's the gradients that will move us around to different k points. We'll talk about this more today, but gradients will move us around to different k points so we can acquire those different k points, get a spatial frequency weighting of our under, underlying object, uh, integrate that in, into our coil so that we have a perceived or received magnitude of the uh, presence or absence of that particular spatial frequency. And so this was sort of the graphical depiction of the same thing, right? We have some underlying object, we have a particular spatial frequency uh, encoding at a particular, say, point in time because of the gradient that's been applied, and the product of these two will give rise to a, a signal that we detect in our, in our coil, and through that long process of uh, phase-sensitive detection and low-pass filtering, we can get to uh, a point where we uh, can discuss the MR signal equation that's shown here. Um, and one of the things we were talking about at the end of the lecture, and we'll talk about a little bit more today, was this principle that gradients move us through k-space. And I want you guys to appreciate this in sort of some you know, relatively applied and, and hands-on terms. And so the thing that we really control in an MR experiment is the gradient waveform. We can turn the gradients on, we can turn the gradients off, and we can do that with really pretty high spatial, uh, sorry, high temporal fidelity. 
meaning that we can control these things on the order of microseconds or even less. Um, and the idea that I'm trying to point out here is the connection between where we are in k-space and the applied gradient itself. And it's a relatively straightforward relationship. It's just the time uh, integral of the gradient waveform multiplied by some constants tells us where we are in k-space. And so if our gradient waveform is relatively simple and it's just a box function like this, we can talk about what's the k po what k-point are we at uh, just before the gradient is turned on and we effectively integrate you know, a function that looks like zero, and so we haven't gone anywhere in k-space, and so we're uh, just at the k-space origin, if you will. So that's mapped out in k-space as just being this middle point here. As the gradient is turned on and then left on for some period of time, we're adding up area, gradient area, right? And this integrating function here tells us that the more gradient we have you know, over time, the larger and larger our underlying k-value will be. And in fact, for a, a gradient that's just a box gradient or a rect function like this, the uh, where we are in k-space will just be linearly increasing as that gradient is turned on for longer and longer. And so you can see here that as a function of time, we're actually moving out farther and farther in k-space. Our gradient's been turned on for some you know, period of time, and now it's turned on for twice that period of time that we've moved out farther in k-space. And while we're Essentially, we're, we're moving through k-space. This is a dynamic process, but every time we're at a, call it, point in k-space, we're getting you know hundreds or thousands of samples in our receiver coil because everything I'm showing you here is really in the, in the rotating frame. Uh, you have to remember in the lab frame, our protons are still zipping around at, at the Larmor frequency. So for the brief period of time, even if it's just microseconds that I effectively visit this position in k-space, my spins have zipped past my coil maybe a thousand times. And so they're flexing into my coil and allowing me to receive a signal that accords with that particular point in k-space. And I'm just continuously, in this case, continuously moving out along this, uh, say, x-axis, which is frequently uh, referred to as the readout axis uh, as a function of time. So importantly, uh, through this equation here and through this sort of example here, uh, we appreciate that gradients are what move us through k-space. Um, so now I want to go back and link up some of the concepts that we had uh, related to spatial localization and relate them also to k-space. So this will link back to some of the uh, lecture material that Dr. Song covered, uh, as well as some of the things that we've covered in the, uh, the two previous lectures that I've given. So at, at this point in time, and, and certainly at the, at the end of this sort of block of slides, I want you guys to appreciate every feature that's in this relatively simple pulse sequence diagram. They get much more complicated after this if this is, uh, isn't complicated enough already. And there's three principal events that are required to do so-called spatial localization. Uh, you have some background in this already, but we're going to dig into it some more today. The first is slice selection. We have to excite the slice that we care to image. It could be any slice. We have to turn on the appropriate gradients to create a plane of isochromats and then have an RF pulse that's tuned to that plane of isochromats. And that requires, and we'll talk about this in a second, but it requires a combination of an RF pulse and a gradient being turned on. The second step, and these have to occur uh, essentially in this order for Cartesian imaging, which is the bulk of how uh, MR images are acquired. The second step is phase encoding. And we'll talk more about how gradients move us through uh, case space in such a way that we can acquire the different phase and code lines. And the last thing is actually frequency encoding. And frequency encoding is, is kind of two things at the same time. It allows us to form, these gradients allow us to form the echo, the gradient echo, for example. This is a gradient echo sequence that's shown. Uh, but at the same time, we're forming the echo. We're also getting some spatial frequency information. And it's during this plateau, and I, I should have drawn it actually as, a, as the, say, fifth axis here. But it's from this point here, you can see this gradient's on just a little bit, right? It has a relatively low amplitude, and it's turned on in this case for uh, about a millisecond. Uh, this relatively low amplitude gradient that's constant for, uh, in MR terms, a relatively long period of time uh, is, is essential for helping us form the echo, but also doing the spatial frequency encoding. Take it at this as so let's talk about slice selection again. Hopefully this isn't too repetitive, but there's really three really important components to it. 
Uh, and I would expect, for example, that on an exam, you'd be able to sort of label and tell me everything that's going on in a figure like this, whether it's this whole sequence or, or perhaps another. Okay, so what's going on here when we just look at slice selection? Well, there's really three principal components to it. The RF pulse, the RF pulse has to contain frequencies matched to the slice of interest. What does that mean? It has to have a center frequency that's matched to the slice, and it has to include not just the center frequency, but a range of frequencies close to the center frequency, such that it excites a, a relatively narrow range of, uh, of isochromats that are equivalent to the slice that we want to excite. Uh, at the same time we're playing this RF pulse, we have to turn on a slice selection gradient. And that slice selection gradient is just part two down here. It's, it's, it's almost always a constant magnitude gradient. That constant magnitude gradient, again, sets up a distribution of, of Larmor frequencies, and the RF pulse is then tuned to a narrow band of the Larmor frequencies that we care to excite. Maybe it's in my neck, maybe it's in my head, maybe it's somewhere in my chest. The one that we uh, haven't talked about too much, and I'll only talk about it sort of qualitatively today, but I'll show you some a simulation that hopefully makes this a little bit more clear, uh, is this third gradient here at the end of slice selection. This is called the slice select rephasing gradient. And it's actually a really important gradient because it helps you overall increase the signal to noise. Uh, and the reason it helps you increase the signal to noise is it actually rephases spins within the slice. So think about uh, this, uh, think about this Z, this is say a slice select gradient, right? So I've turned this gradient on so I can get a distribution of spins from say my head down to my feet. If I turn that gradient on for a period of time and then I turn it off, all of the spins from say my head to my toes will have different phase because the amount of phase you have depends on the gradient in your position. So I'll have a lot of phase say up towards my head, I'll have an intermediate amount of phase at my neck, and I'll have a lot of, say, negative phase as I get down into my chest or something like this. So there's a distribution of phases through the slice, not just through like the body, but there's even a distribution of phases through the slice. If you have a distribution of phases coming from some region of interest, does that give you more signal or less signal? Less signal, right? But we know how these spins are dephased. We know they're dephased as a consequence of this slice select gradient that's turned on here. And it turns out that most of the dephasing happens after the middle of the RF pulse. So it's not an obvious thing, but the effect of this RF pulse, uh, uh, it's important that it has this kind of shape so we get the, a box-like excitation, a, a, a narrow excitation of the slice that we care about. But the, and you'll see this in a simulation in a second, but most of the action of that RF pulse isn't really happening until about the middle of the RF pulse. And that means that the spins can't really accrue much phase until basically the second half of this gradient. So they're getting phase from the second half of this gradient. If I want to undo that phase, I can by turning on an equal and opposite gradient after my RF pulse has completed itself. So to be uh, maybe more clear, the area of this gradient here that's labeled three is gonna have half the area of the gradient here that's labeled two. And that'll, in principle, rephase the spins in, within the slice and give us back some signal to noise. And that can be substantial, uh, a, a substantial amount of signal to noise gain. Okay, so here's uh, just one more example, and we'll look at a movie of this. So this is the RF pulse tuned to the, to the frequencies of interest. Uh, this top part of the gradient waveform here for slice selection is going to create the range of frequencies that we need to, uh, to uh, enable slice selection. And this lower part of the gradient here is going to rephase spins in the slice to increase the signal to noise. I'll probably have to play through this a couple times, but what's going to happen in a second is you're going to see this sort of line sweeping up across the gradient waveform. Uh, and then we'll see some animations over here of a spin system. So. Uh, Let's see if I can, let me get you oriented first. Okay, so on the right hand side here, we have two different perspectives on the same spins. This direction here, the Z direction, um, uh, is basically the, the slice direction. And so I have a bunch of spins. These spins down here are outside of the slice that I care about. These spins up here are outside of the slice that I care about. And what I'm doing, I'm doing a block simulation on a, on a family of spins, and I'm trying to show, will show, that only these spins in the middle here are really affected by this RF pulse. And you'll see their effect because it will lead to the, the spins being tipped over into the transverse plane, while other spins are relatively unaffected. Okay? 
So what we're, what we're hoping to see, expecting to see, is that only spins in the middle of this sort of slab will be excited. Only some of those spins will be tipped down. Those will be the spins that are in the slice that we want to image. Uh, shown uh, sort of adjacent here is now you're looking down, I'll, I'll call it looking down the barrel, you're looking down the z-axis here. And you're going to see how the spins tip over into the transverse plane, but they'll end up with a range of phases as a consequence of the slice select gradient. Slice select gradient is going to cause dephasing uh, while you're also getting excited spins, you're also getting transverse magnetization. And what you're going to see then is at the end of this, when this gradient becomes uh, the only thing that's active, the spins in this view will be shown to rephase, meaning they'll all come back into alignment again with one another. Uh, and that's a good thing because it gives you spin phase coherence and that should increase your signal spins, will increase your signal spins. So let me back up here and we'll watch this play out. So here is the RF pulse and the gradients are starting to be active and you see the spins are kind of wiggling around. Not much happens until you get to the middle of the RF pulse and now the spins are tipping down into the transverse plane, but they all have a range of phases. And that range of phases is also seen in this view here. And then it's this last gradient here uh, that brings everything back into phase. So we'll watch, it, we'll watch it again. I know it goes a little bit quickly. The peak of the RF pulse is where most of the energy is going into the system and tipping over the spins, but they're all gonna end up with different phases. And you can see all of those different phases when you look down the axis of those spins. And now we start to rephase when we apply this rephasing gradient. And there you can see at the very end there, I'll, I'll pause it here. Um, at the very end here, you, you can see obviously that the spins are, are pretty well dephased. Uh, and it's only with the application of that rephasing gradient that the, spin is, uh, that the spins are brought into spin phase coherence. So, oops, let me try this one more time. That it should be. Okay. So the net effect is at the end of all of this, when we look down the axis, all the spins are pointing in the same direction. That's a good thing in terms of signal to noise. And that's the effect of this rephasing gradient here. And the other thing that you'll see is that for the most part, spins below our slice were relatively unaffected. They weren't excited. They're just pointing along Z still. Spins above our slice are effectively doing the same thing. They're mostly pointed along the Z axis. There's some edge effect, right? Our slice, uh, our, our slice selectivity is not perfect. We don't exactly excite a box-like slice. And so we have some spins that are partly excited, but the bulk of our slices, uh, given the RF pulse and gradient that we applied, the bulk of our spins rather are really generally pointing just along, uh, say a single direction, and they're fully tilted into the transverse plane. And this would be an example of a 90 degree RF pulse. Okay. Questions about sort of how this came together? Yep. So at the end of the slice, slice select gradient, technically the, the entire body, all the slices are still in phase, except some of them are in MS line somewhat. Is that how it works? Um, are you talking about what's happening in the slice, or are you talking about what's happening sort of everywhere? The rephasing, that affects all the slices, right? Yeah, so, gra so gradients affect spins anywhere within the sort of active volume of the gradient. So they don't affect spins miles away, but they have a sensitive volume that the gradients act on. So technically, like, everything is rephased the same, so even things outside the slice, right? Yeah, but it gets a little tricky because say these spins up here, they were never, ideally they weren't excited at all. And as they approach just being pure Z magnetization, their phase is undefined, right? I can't really talk about their phase. They have to be a little bit off axis before I can even measure or talk about their phase. But in principle, yeah, any spin um, would, would come back into say the same phase. Yep. Other questions? Okay, so this is just a block simulation, right? I mean, it's a little bit, it's a lot of bells and whistles to sort of make it come out like this, but it's just putting spins uh, that are subject, you know, a family of spins that are subject to that RF pulse and these gradients. And in this case, there was no X gradient, there was no Y gradient. Um, 
Okay, so let's talk about frequency encoding the first thing. That was the first step was, fate, uh, was the slice selection. Now I'm going to jump to frequency encoding, although that's the third part of the total spatial encoding block, right? We'll come back to phase encoding in just a second. So what does frequency encoding consist of? Well, it consists of the frequency encoding gradient. We have to turn on some gradient for some period of time and then turn it off. Uh, for Cartesian imaging, which is all we really care about in this class, uh, it's going to be a constant magnitude. It's just going to be a, a gradient that's turned on, and at some later time, it's turned off. Uh, importantly, there's no simultaneous RF. We're not doing anything else at that point in time. There's no other gradients uh, are at play at the same time. So all these other things like phase encoding, slice encoding, crushers, whatever, they have to happen at a, at a different part of your pulse sequence, if you will. Um, and this is this plateau period here, this readout gradient here, I should have, again, drawn another axis. This is when we're recording and listening for data. We don't bother to do that during the entire pulse sequence. There's only certain periods of time where we're expecting an echo and turning on our receiver system to listen for that echo. Uh, there are, again, two parts to this gradient waveform, and we'll see sort of what, what importance that has in a second. Uh, the first part, uh, number three here, is called the readout prephasing gradient. And you saw this in the gradient echo lecture, but it helps prepare the spin phase so you get a peak echo amplitude at the middle of the readout, at the middle of the echo time, which is going to be right in the middle of this gradient. And I'll show you an example of that sort of happening with a simulation in just a second. Uh, sometimes this gradient is called the readout dephasing gradient. Um, more often it's the readout prephasing gradient. Uh, MR, again, suffers from a bit of jargon. Uh, and what does that gradient do? Well, it does a couple things. It helps us form the echo, but it also adds a linear spatial variation of frequency. And you'll see that in distinction to what the phase encoding gradient is going to do. The phase encoding gradient is going to add a linear spatial variation of phase. Here we're getting a linear spatial variation of frequency, meaning when we turn on a gradient, we've got high frequencies at one end of the field of view, intermediate frequencies in the middle, and then maybe low frequencies on the far side of the field of view. Uh, and we saw this before from the gradient echo lecture. We know that that combination of gradients one and three here are what help us form the gradient echo uh, itself. So let's look at uh, uh, the gradient echo sequence and how we can move around case space, right? We, we introduced this concept a couple times now. The gradients are what move us around case space. So we know we need to play an RF pulse with a gradient and the slice select refocusing gradient to excite the slice that we care about. And then we saw again in the gradient encoding or the gradient echo lecture that we can play a negative gradient uh, and then this positive gradient to help us form an echo, uh, the large amplitude signal at this you know sort of designated echo time. And what I want to do is just make the connection again about uh, the gradients that are applied and how it is the gradients move us around in case space. The relationship again is just through this integral, right? Where I am in case space at a particular point in time just depends on the, the time integral of my gradient waveform at some constants. And so let's uh, use this example first. Let's say my gradient waveform is a negative gradient uh, and it's turned on for, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a constant amplitude and it's turned on for some finite duration. Uh, if I integrate this gradient waveform uh, as over time, then I can see that my case space value will initially start at zero. And because it's a negative gradient, I'll be moving out along the negative k direction uh, up until the end of that gradient waveform. And that means that I'm starting somewhere at uh, the middle of k space. I haven't turned any gradients on yet, so I naturally start at the middle of k space. And this negative gradient waveform is going to move me out along the negative, in this case, readout direction, the kr. And so I see my k value is increasingly more and more negative as a function of time. The second part of this frequency encoding gradient is just flipped over the other way. And so now I turn on a positive gradient waveform. It's uh, perhaps of equal amplitude and it's gonna be for say twice as long. And now I'm gonna move through K space from wherever I was, but I'm gonna move through it in the positive direction all the way through to some other say positive K point at which point I turn my gradient off. So the combination of these sort of two gradient lobes move me through k space as a function of time according to what's shown on this diagram here. Uh, and if we look at what's happening in k space itself, I'm going to move out negatively to the left with that, uh, with that uh, prephasing gradient. And then the readout gradient itself is going to have me sweeping across from left to right. Now, at every, say, point in k space, and we have to talk about what we really mean by point in k space, we'll get to that later, uh, 
at every point in k-space, remember, my spins are zipping past my coil thousands of times, and that gives me the flux I need to measure the amplitude of that spatial frequency. And because my gradient is just on and continuously on, I'm just continuously moving across k-space. And I'm actually doing that relatively slowly compared to the Larmor frequency. So at the Larmor frequency, I'm zipping past my coil a thousand times, and then I sort of move to another point in k-space, and I effectively zip past it you know, a thousand more times until I've visited all the you know, different uh, k points that I need to reconstruct the image that I uh, have asked for. And what you've asked for will depend on things like the field of view and the number of points or the resolution that you want to obtain. Okay, so here's a, here's a family of spins spread out across the field of view. Uh, and let's say that at, uh, at the, I'm at the origin of k-space. I'm at the zero point of k-space. I haven't moved anywhere with my gradients yet. Uh, then if I look at, um, say, the frequency as a function of, if, if I look at the, uh, the pattern in my spins right now, they're all just oriented in the same direction, right? I haven't, I haven't done anything interesting yet because my gradient has just been, uh, my gradient, I'm at the middle of k-space and the fundamental frequency of these spins is just the DC frequency. It's very, very flat. And that's in distinction to moving out further in k-space. So when I move out further in k-space, say, out to this point here, I can start setting up a distribution of phases in my spins, and those distribution of phases arise from the fact that spins on the left-hand side are going to be precessing really quickly, and, and spins in the middle will be not precessing, at least in the rotating frame, and then spins on the far right-hand side will be precessing, say, anti-clockwise to those on the left-hand side. And if I look at the phase of these spins across, say, the field of view, now I'm mapping out some, say, uh, low value to some high value to some low value. So I have one period across uh, my field of view now. And that means I've moved out to a, a point in k-space where I can sample a spatial frequency that has one period across the field of view. This isn't the best example to show for the spatial frequency I'm encoding right now because this is shown in a diagonal. I should have shown something that was really just one period going from left to right. We move out further in k-space, and this just means I've turned my gradient on for longer. It's the same amplitude, but now it's on for twice as long, or it's the same amplitude, and now it's turned on for three times as long. I'm basically winding up my spins, if you will. I'm giving more, I'm, I'm giving a, a, a tighter and tighter spatial frequency to the spin system across the field of view. And that's going to accord with uh, being further and further out in case space. So at this point, at this point here, and I've moved out further to the right until this point here, I've moved out the farthest to the right. And so what you can picture uh, happening underneath is you're setting up these different spatial frequency patterns in the magnetization. This is what it looks like in the laboratory, sorry, in the rotating frame. In the laboratory frame, it has this pattern, but every spin is also going at the Larmor frequency, so it's harder to see or show that. Uh, so this is uh, sort of dynamically what's actually happening. So here we have a gradient that's turned on. The gradient's going to switch. Uh, sorry, this isn't the gradient. This is the field. So when we turn on a gradient, the effective field is the gradient dotted with what? How, the field effect of a gradient depends not on the, not just the gradient amplitude, but also the position of the spin, right? And so what's being shown underneath here is the gradient dotted with position. So when my gradient is turned on, things towards the left and right are going to have higher frequencies, and things in the middle aren't going to process at all because they're at isocenter, and this is the rotating frame. And so this is the effect of turning on a gradient across space. So as a function of space, when a gradient's turned on, I have no effective field, say, right at isocenter, but I can have a, a relatively, say, negative effective field or a positive effective field, depending on what my spatial position is. It's field that affects the Larmor frequency, right? And so this diagram is showing, from the beginning here, is showing how spins can, uh, can be given phase and how the phase can be taken away. It'll make a little bit more sense when we show it in combination with the actual frequency encoding gradient, hopefully. So let me uh, let me get this all started in synchrony here. Yeah. So this is this gradient is going to switch directions now during the readout gradient. So this is my readout gradient happening here, and this is the readout prephasing gradient. You'll see the gradient here is going to switch directions in 
when it gets to the end there. We're back at the beginning of the simulation. At this, at this point here during the readout gradient, when I hit my echo time, look what happens to all my spins. They're all in phase, right? Right when I came through the echo time, everything was perfectly back in phase again. And that's what gives me that large amplitude signal at my echo time. So watch again as the spin system comes back into phase at the echo time right there. That wouldn't happen at the echo time if I didn't have this readout pre-phasing gradient. This readout pre-phasing gradient gives some phase to the spin system that the equal and opposite gradient, the actual readout gradient itself, then takes away. And the combination of this pre-phasing gradient and the readout gradient itself is what gives rise to all the spins being in phase and consequently the formation of what we think of as the echo. So it's those things in, in combination. Uh, questions about what I was showing here? I know it's, it's, it's hard to sort of take it all in, but I'm trying to give you multiple sort of perspectives on the same thing. Okay, so let's talk about the, 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 the last component here, which was the phase encoding and what does it do? So phase encoding uh, consists of, a, obviously, the phase encoding gradient. And the magnitude of that gradient is going to change with every TR, right? For every TR, we basically acquire a single echo. But we have to get all of the echoes that fill K-space. And we do that by marching around K-space uh, by using the, the phase encoding gradient. Uh, you can, it turns out, overlap the phase encoding gradient with other things that you're doing. So that's uh, specifically, we've talked about the slice selection uh, rephasing gradient and the readout dephasing gradient. You can effectively do these things all at the, at the same time. Uh, we use this all the time with Cartesian imaging, that's the sort of focus of this course. And it has to happen after excitation but before readout. So I'm talking about a third, but it's really the second step in, in terms of the spatial encoding events. And uh, similar to what frequency encoding did, the phase encoding is going to add a linear spatial variation of the phase. So we were looking in that previous animation at how frequency changes from the right-hand edge of the field of view to the left-hand edge of the field of view. Here, it would just be uh, imparting a phase to the spin system rather than uh, specifically changing the frequency. Uh, and we can do this for different purposes. Uh, we can phase encode just on a single direction for two-dimensional imaging. There's actually, uh, you saw this a little bit in Dr. Sung's uh, second lecture, uh, that you can do phase encoding along two directions and thereby get true three-dimensional imaging, meaning you're encoding spatial information over a large volume, say the whole head, but you're doing it in such a way that you can resolve three-dimensional information, not just getting individual 2D slices, but actually foyer encoding along, say, the slice direction. And that's a really... Uh, potentially powerful technique for high resolution imaging. The downside is it can take quite a bit of time uh, to acquire that many phase encode steps. Uh, and you'll remember, we'll see this in just a second, but it's really the number of phase encode steps that strongly governs your total acquisition time, right? We have to acquire a phase encode for every TR, and if we need 128 phase encode steps and 128 TRs, then that total acquisition time could be considerable. We can certainly get into the you know tens of seconds or minutes range uh, very easily. Uh, so yeah, only one phase encode step per echo. Uh, and we remember that a single phase encode step will just give us, say, a line through k-space like this. We have to map out all the various lines of k-space that are required for you know, the, the imaging experiment we're trying to uh, perform. And then through the 2D Fourier transform, we'll talk about this a lot today, uh, we can finally recover an image of the object. So where am I in case space? So let's go back to this gradient echo uh, sequence that we had before. We know a thing or two about uh, slice selection now. And I said that the phase encoding gradient could be applied at the same time as the, as the slice select rephasing gradient. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so we have this phase encoding gradient, and it also overlaps with the so-called frequency encoding gradient. And so uh, if we look at the combination of playing those two gradients at the same time, uh, that's effectively, I've, I've, I've simplified it to be just a box function along the readout direction and a box function along the phase encode direction. And the combination of these two very similar looking gradient waveforms will move me out along the negative direction on the K readout axis and will move me out along the negative direction along the K uh, phase encode axis. This should be a KP or KPE uh, axis. And so the point is, if I look at where I am at the, at the end of this gradient waveform for, uh, for K readout and for K phase encode, I've come down to the negative, negative quadrant. Uh, 
And so the application of those two gradients is moving me out in K space out to some point over here. Now, I could actually acquire data during that period of time if I wanted to. Uh, there's a handful of reasons why we typically don't do that, but in principle, you could. Uh, more typically, what comes next is the readout gradient. And so the readout gradient itself is going to be uh, basically twice the area of the readout prephasing gradient. And it's going to move us along K space along the readout direction. So we know we're going to, we expect to move from left to right. And that's not simultaneous with any phase encoding gradients. And so we're only moving unidirectionally through K space. We're only going to move along the K readout direction in K space. And you can see that our K, uh, the, U, the, the magnitude of our K value, if you will, goes from being something negative. And the longer our gradient is turned on, uh, I eventually come back to the middle of K space, uh, K readout equals zero, and then move past the origin out to a positive value for K space. My phase encode gradient, on the other hand, I just moved out to some point in time. So I moved out to some position and I just maintained that position because I never did anything else after it. I didn't rewind it. I didn't wind it up further. I just turned that gradient off. And so sometimes people talk about gradients as storing phase. I can store phase or I can move along K space and that position is effectively held until I do something else with my gradient. So this is how we would get to acquiring, say, a single line of k-space. Uh, we, of course, need to repeat this a bunch of different times. And the basic idea is just by modulating uh, the area of this phase encoding gradient, I can move out to different points in k-space. And so I, I won't go through the example uh, in the same way that I just did, but if we look just quickly at this red positive phase encoding gradient, it still happens in combination with the same readout gradient, but because this is positive, uh, and this gradient is negative, I'm going to move up to a different point in k-space originally, up to the negative uh, k-readout direction and the positive k-phase encode direction. And then that same readout gradient, which is here shown in purple, uh, is going to move me across k-space from left to right. I'll get a different line of k-space data. Then my job, or our job, is that we need to acquire all of the enough phase encode steps to fill enough lines of k-space so we can reconstruct the, the, the object, or the image of the object that we care to reconstruct. Yep. Why would you move your k-space position when you're trying to get slice selection for gradient? No, it's a great question, right? So uh, in, in principle, you are this gradient here, right? I think that's what you're asking about. Yeah, so th there is a formalism called excitation k-space, and you are moving through k-space through the application of this gradient as well. Um, another, when I was talking about this, this the, the slice like rephasing gradient a second ago, I was talking about bringing all the spins back into phase, right? So conceptually, we sort of saw maybe how that happens. You can also think about this gradient as steering you on or off this plane of k-space. Right, so we have a third direction. The third direction of k-space would just be orthogonal to these two, and it would be in and out of this plane. These gradients are moving me on or off of that plane. Fortunately, uh, and by design, it was really only the second half of this gradient that had much action on the on the spins, and that was why I only needed this this an area here that was uh, half the area of my slice select gradient. And so this second half here has effectively moved me off of the plane I'm showing you here. And this gradient has effectively brought me back down into the plane that I'm showing you here. Oh, that's the reason for the negative part. That's another reason for it. Yeah. So it's bringing everything back into phase, but it's also putting you on the right KZ plane, if you will, which is just the KZ equals zero plane. In true three-dimensional imaging, you would actually be cycling a gradient like this one through multiple, multiple steps, and you would be able to acquire multiple planes of k-space. And those would just be a, another dimensionality to the Fourier space you were acquiring. Yep. Is there a reason that you don't need to like apply a, a combination of phase and phase and phase to get back to the zero or to the k-space origin? Is that sort of the spoiler there? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. And so I think the question is, uh, I, I, you know, I can understand how the, the two gradients at the beginning move me out to this point, and I can understand how the readout gradient brings me across k-space, and, and now things seem to come to a sudden end, what, what happened and why. Uh, and I didn't mention I should have, but typically we would play something like a spoiler gradient. And the spoiler gradient would 
would uh, completely dephase the available transverse magnetization. So you sort of scramble any available signal. And that's, that's, that's effectively bringing you back to zero or bringing you back to sort of a, 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 a new state of magnetization where the magnetization is just along the z-axis. There are pulse sequences uh, that, would, that are called balanced sequences. Um, and if I wanted to balance the sequence out, meaning I wanted to come from this point all the way back to my origin again, origin again before exciting, then I would have to complete this readout gradient waveform with another negative load to get me back towards the origin. And I would also have to have an equal and opposite phase encoding gradient. And that would bring me from this corner back to the origin. Those so-called balance sequences are nice because they don't depend on a spoiler gradient. You don't have to play the spoiler gradient, so you're not spoiling or wasting any of your magnetization. Uh, but they're really tricky sequences. You're, you're sort of recycling the magnetization. You're always coming back to the origin. But uh, you can effectively integrate a lot of errors very quickly and then get all kinds of disasters. It, it's a very useful technique, but it's, it's, very, it's a little tricky uh, in terms of its uh, implementation and uh, the artifacts that you those are good questions. Okay. So uh, I hope that was another way of sort of connecting with you guys, sort of gradient waveforms, case space, where we are in case space, and the importance of the different gradient waveforms in a, say, typical uh, pulse sequence. Um, what I want to do now is transition to talking about image reconstruction, which is what this lecture is supposed to be mostly about and how it is that we actually recover the image. We've talked about having some object in the scanner. We've talked about spatially encoding information so we can measure all the different K points. I want to talk a little bit formally about how we actually recover the image of the underlying object. And that's through the process of image reconstruction. This is laid out in, in sort of even more detail in the, in the Lauderber book. I'll, I, I think I didn't update the, uh, the references on the website yet for this, but I'll do that this afternoon. But the basic problem amounts to something like this. We have a bunch of measured signals, right? This is just sort of a general statement for image reconstruction. You have a bunch of signals that you measure, whatever they are. They might be projection information in CT. They might be, uh, uh, they could be positron counts in a PET scanner. They could be K points that you measured in an MR scanner. Um, and the measured signals relate to the underlying image function, the thing that you care about, uh, through some spatial information encoding scheme. Uh, lots of different ways to encode spatial information. What we mostly talk about in MR is using uh, the K-space formalism and Cartesian imaging, which means that there's an underlying Fourier transform relationship between our object and the data that we acquire. This is the so-called data consistency constraint. There has to be, uh, there has to be a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between the measured signals and the underlying image itself through some, trans some spatial information encoding scheme. The tricky bit is that what we really want to recover is not the measured signals. The measured signals in some way aren't that interesting to us. What we want to recover is the actual image of the, of the underlying object itself. And to do so, we have to have some kind of uh, way of inverting the spatial encoding process such that the, invert, uh, the inverse of the spatial uh, encoding scheme can act on the, the data that we actually measured so we can then recover the image. The image is, at the end of the day, the only thing we really care about. So what I want to try to uh, get across today is, is our main task, which is to recover the imaging information from these measured uh, K data. And we've been kind of waving our hands a lot and saying, oh, hey, you get it from a Fourier transform. And that's mostly true, but this will give you a little bit more insight as to how that happens and, and maybe why. Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit complicated, but and, and, and we'll work through it, uh, not on the board, uh, but I want to try to conceptually get to it, and I'll point out the equations that I, that I think are really key. Um, this one we saw at the very beginning of the lecture. It's just the basic MR signal equation. The one change that I've made now at this point is that rather than talking about the transverse magnetization, we just talk about the image, right? It's the thing that we care about is the snapshot of the transverse magnetization. It carries with it T1 or T2 contrast. We now just call that the image. So the image of our underlying object is recovered by sampling, uh, 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 by applying different spatial frequency encoding terms, and then measuring their uh, respective amplitudes as we move ourselves through K space. And what we'll talk about is how there's a Fourier transform relationship now uh, that, that arises from this. This, this. this is effectively seen in this uh, integral equation at the top. Uh, 
between the underlying image and the K points that we measure. We can expand this out into 1D or 2D or 3D, and the only point here uh, is to show that you have independent control of K space along the different directions, along the KX direction, through application of the, of the X gradient, uh, all the way through to uh, controlling the KZ component, which we were just talking about, right? Moving on or off of that plane of, of K space, um, we can control that uh, by the application of the G, uh, Z gradient, for example. So given that we appreciate this expression here, the MR signal equation, uh, and we know that all these different amplitudes of these different spatial frequencies are related uh, to the underlying image uh, itself, how do we actually determine, how do we invert this, right? It's not it's made obvious how you invert this to recover the actual image, the thing we care about. Um, so let's, let's think this through a little bit. If we look at this spatial frequency encoding term here, we actually do something with regularity in Cartesian imaging. We're always thinking about the same step sizes. We always have delta Ks that are, uh, that are determined by our chosen field of view, right? The field of view is one over delta K. We pick our field of view, delta K is fixed. And that dictates that uh, the K points that we actually care about are just N multiples of some delta K where n is just a bunch of integers that, that move us through the, the specific and discrete lines of k-space, for example. So we're just saying that uh, the, the, the space that we care about is actually a bunch of discrete k points or k lines um, that, we, that can be mapped out according to some delta k that we, that we specify. Delta k is linearly and specifically related to the field of view. And then we just need to get a bunch of these, right? Um, as I acquire more and more, right? So here I'm saying I need, I need to get n uh, k points and I'm starting, I'm going sort of symmetrically about zero. What changes about the, the underlying image that I acquire if I have a larger, larger n? Higher resolution, right? So if I map out uh, from n, you know, minus a million to plus a million, I have a very high resolution image because I've gone very far out in k-space a million times delta k. That gets me out to the extremes of k-space, so to speak, very high resolution information. It also takes a considerable amount of time. And so in general, we can't take the time to go that far out in the k-space. So we have a constraint on what we're able to do. And uh, as a function, the integers n that we care about are typically in the you know, dozens or hundreds or something like this uh, before we start hitting uh, limitations on, say, total scan time. Okay, so uh, we can make this substitution, which just basically says, well, we don't actually care about k as some continuous variable. We just care about k as some discrete variable uh, where n is some integer and delta kx is fixed by a field of view in the x direction. So, Easy enough. This is just the one dimensional case. Going to two dimensions just means we have another uh, complex exponential term, uh, and uh, we, could, we could map that out if we wanted to. So, again, this is what we actually measure, right? We measure the amplitude of those k points specifically at, at locations n delta k, right? Those are the points in k space that we actually measure, the discrete points in k space that we care about, so to speak. Uh, but this is what we actually want. So the question is how to go about inverting this. And the actual inversion process is a little bit complicated. What, what's born out of it is, is a new set of expressions. Uh, you can follow this more carefully in the, in the Lauterber book. But it basically says that we can recover uh, what's called the periodic extension of our image. But it's really basically just the image itself. We can recover the image itself by adding up all of the weights, all of those different magnitude points in k-space multiplied onto their respective spatial frequencies. So that means if I take those different spatial frequency patterns and I multiply by the, white, the right weight, this S of n here is the right weight, and now I add them all up, I'll recover something that looks like the, the image uh, itself. And that's not exactly obvious. We've talked about it sort of qualitatively. This is that same statement quantitatively. Uh, what do we mean by the periodic extension? Well, the periodic extension just means that mathematically that underlying, those spatial frequency patterns just go forever. Uh, and in this inversion process, the field of view itself is replicated adjacent to itself forever. We don't care about that. We don't care about the periodic extensions. We just care about the image itself. The image itself is tiled mathematically sort of in adjacent fields of view. We can crop that down very discreetly just to get to the field of view we care about. 
So this, what matters is that this right-hand side here effectively represents the image of the underlying object. And it simply arises by adding up the appropriate spatial frequency terms multiplied by the, the appropriate amplitude. And the appropriate amplitude is the one that we measured for the specific object that we're trying to uh, uh, acquire the image for. So this is uh, uh, maybe linking it together a little bit. This is what I mean by the periodic extension, right? So this is the field of view that we care about, the field of view that we designate on the scanner dictates our delta k. If you're working on this in your homework assignment right now, or maybe you have already. Um, the field of view is governed by one over delta k. Mathematically, if we carry out these expressions, we would end up reconstructing uh, an, an, an image that had a periodic extension uh, over all of space, say. We don't care about that. We just crop it down to the field of view that we actually specified. So if we look at this relationship on the left-hand side, this is just a uh, in this case, an infinite Fourier series, because we're summing up from minus infinity to infinity. We're going to talk about that in just a second, because we don't want to do that. We don't want to sample all possible spatial frequencies. We're going to discretize this even further in just a second. Delta k is some fundamental frequency, meaning we're stepping. n is an integer. Delta k is some step size in k-space. And it becomes some fundamental frequency that we're sampling at. And these S of n's, they're just the coefficients of these basically n harmonics, right? So again, we're getting the amplitude of these different spatial frequency terms, and they tell us how much, uh, you know, the relative presence or absence of a particular spatial frequency encoding term. The right-hand side here is a little more cumbersome, a little harder to, you know, maybe directly understand, but the bottom line is it represents the periodic extension of I of x. That's just this, this uh, sort of shown uh, schematically on the bottom here n we know is an integer, uh, and the period of the, re of the replication is just 1 over delta k, or, uh, which is equal to the field of view. And that's a good thing, right? That means that these objects, if, if you specify an appropriate field of view for your object, you won't have overlaps in the periodic extension. The concept of aliasing actually arises when you choose a field of view too small, such that you, uh, you're not encoding over the entire object itself, and the periodic extensions uh, now overlap and, and, and result in aliasing. Uh, and that's obviously to be avoided. Okay, so infinite sampling is not such a great thing, right? So this expression here indicated that we were, we were summing up things from minus infinity to infinity. We're not actually going to be able to do that because that would mean we'd have to have you know, an infinite number of, of uh, spatial frequency coefficients, and that's going to take obviously way too long to acquire. So we need to discretize this a little bit further. Uh, we, know we, can, uh, we know that we can, uh, we can get I of X, the image itself can be, re uh, can be recovered rather from its periodic extension. Uh, specifically, if the image itself is zero outside of the field of view, this is what's called a space limited signal. So if we don't expect any signal to be coming, out, coming from outside of the field of view, this is a space-limited signal, and we're able to recover uh, the image itself. What does that mean? Well, it means we can finally, and this is this is one expression. We're gonna we're gonna boil this down. And if if you're if this is a little hard to follow, we're gonna get it down to one expression that we really care about in about three or four slides. This expression here just says we can recover the image itself by adding up all of the spatial frequencies of the appropriate amplitude. Uh, uh, to get the underlying object itself, if it's a space-limited uh, object, meaning that the object itself does not extend outside of its field of view. But that sum at the bottom there is from you know infinity minus infinity to infinity. That takes a long time. I've said it two or three times. We don't really want to do that. So we want to limit ourselves to the spatial frequencies we're actually going to acquire because uh, infinity takes forever. So. Now we introduce this idea of the Fourier step size, and all we're saying is that we have this delta k, right? We're marching through discrete points in k-space according to some delta k that we've specified. How do we specify delta k? We specify delta k from our field of view. Field of view is 1 over delta k. And now uh, what we want to do is we want to map out uh, all of the spatial frequencies, but on a finite range. So a few slides ago, we were saying, well, we could do this from minus infinity to infinity. We don't really want to do that. We just want to go out and get n points. 
where n is the total number of sample points. So when we think of discrete points in k-space, maybe we're going to get 256 points, maybe we're going to get 96 points, but it's a, it's a discrete and finite uh, number. So here we can specify that the number of points in our image, and this is, you would specify on the scanner as well, you pick effectively your resolution or your matrix size. Do you want to acquire an image that's 512 by 512, or do you want to acquire an image that's 128 by 128? That number of sample points is what capital N represents here. And this is just saying that we're going to collect the different spatial frequencies that accord with using, uh, going from minus big N over two all the way up to plus N over two. And so the limits of our summation have been changed from minus infinity to plus infinity to being discrete. And this ends up being uh, an important relationship for us. It's really the fundamental image reconstruction equation for all of MR. So there was a lot of kind of build up to kind of get to this point. But I want you to have some you know, sense for what this expression means, right? So what it's telling us is that we can, we can satisfy that image reconstruction requirement, whereby we can recover the image itself by adding up discreetly all of the spatial frequencies of appropriate amplitude, uh, of where the appropriate amplitude is the one that we measured as we were moving ourselves through K space. You'll see that the field of view term enters in here, right? Delta K is one over the field of view, field of view is one over delta K. So this is limiting, in, in some sense, uh, the, the object itself to the field of view. Okay, so. Questions about what this expression sort of means for us? Hopefully you understand what, what these points are, these S of Ns are. They're just the discrete amplitudes of the K points, right? And I need to have the right amplitude of a particular spatial frequency to recover the underlying object. We went through a bunch of steps. I'm not too concerned that you understand all of the steps, but this expression here is a good one to understand that we can recover the underlying image itself if we just add up all of the right spatial frequency encoding terms with the right amplitude. And every object, every underlying image is going to have a unique set of S of Ns. The spatial frequency terms are just dictated by things like your field of view and the total number of sample points that you want. So let's see how some of this ties back into how we pick spatial resolution and things like that. Uh, sorry, I'm going to see where, where I am in terms of. Right. Yeah, I'll get through one more section and then we'll see, we'll see if that's okay. All right, so let's, let's think about how this ties into to the actual spatial resolution of our imaging system. So the space, this is one definition, but the spatial resolution of the imaging system is the smallest separation delta x of two point sources, right? Necessary for them to remain resolvable in the resultant image. So we have, we, we take for granted that we have some underlying object, and that object has sort of infinite resolution, right? All the way down to the subatomic level, whatever. We have some imaging uh, uh, procedure, and that imaging procedure will have an associated point spread function, meaning while we try to image or capture an image of the underlying object, it won't perfectly recapitulate the underlying object. And what we do end up getting is what we call an image. We have an image of the underlying object. But the image is generally going to be imperfect in some sense because the way that we go about sampling the information about the underlying object has an underlying point spread function. What kind of point spread function do I need if my object is going to be perfectly recovered in my image? What does this function have to be? This is convolution, right? What is it? it has to be a delta function, right? So if, you, if your point spread function is a delta function, direct delta function, then you perfectly recover an image of the underlying object. <coughs> no imaging system that we use actually has perfect point spread function. And consequently, we want to look at what is the point spread function for an MR imaging system so we can understand what implications that has on things like spatial resolution. So what do we mean by resolution? Well, it's interesting to think about our own visual system, right? So 
uh, with our own visual system, depending on how corrected or uncorrected your vision is, you can see about four or five cycles per millimeter unaided. So just looking at things in front of you, regardless of sort of distance, that's about the distance that you can see, how, many, how close together two things can be, and you can still separate them. Uh, and that means there's sort of different ways of estimating this, but we actually sort of have some limit to the resolvability of objects in our own visual system. And so we see somewhere between 10 million and 100 million sort of pixels in our field of view, if you will. Meaning that things are more, more detailed than that. Of course they are, all the chairs, all the objects around me have incredible detail, uh, but I can't resolve all of that. And that's actually, you guys have probably picked up on this, but that's what gave rise to all these sort of like red displays, right? Why bother having more pixels than you need to have because at some point your human visual system is no good. Now, if you're a, you know, if you're a bird of prey and you're good at spying a mouse from three miles out, well, they need a better phone than even I do, right? At least in principle they do. Um, and I only show this, this United States Air Force resolution target because it gets used as a way of characterizing uh, sort of uh, optical systems frequently. So you have banding patterns with different uh, cycle, uh, with, with different resolvability uh, in different directions, sort of the left, right, and the up, down direction. And you can characterize uh, the, the, sort of the, the conspicuity of your imaging system by imaging a resolution target. And if you can't see a separation of line pairs, then you can't. Uh, you can't uh, resolve things at that specific resolution. So obviously resolving these kinds of banding patterns all the way down to say six is no big deal, but somewhere down in here, at least on this screen, I start losing my ability to resolve differences and it looks to be about the same for you guys as well. Okay, fine. So uh, we said before that the, the underlying image that we acquire is equal to X if and only if that point spread function is a delta function. And so if we look at convolving two different point sources with, uh, with a box function, uh, we can easily resolve those two different point sources in, uh, in our, uh, <clears throat> in our, uh, uh, in our, probably should be written the other way, but if I just convolve these, these point sources with some box function, I can still resolve their separation for the case on the top, they begin to blur for the case in the middle, and they begin to completely overlap. Uh, become very blurry for the case that's shown on the bottom. So we want to minimize uh, the width of our point spread function. Right? We want this to be as closely shaped to a delta function as possible, but there will be limitations in uh, the information that we sample or limitations in the system itself that prevent us from being an actual delta function. So uh, there's different ways to sort of characterize this. The resolution limit of an imaging system is usually characterized by some width and it can be the width of the point spread function. Uh, the point spread function itself is going to be some, you know, some function. Maybe it's Gaussian, maybe it's Poisson, maybe it's a, you know, a box function, whatever. Then one thing that you could measure would be the full width half max. So if you knew that your, uh, if you knew that your uh, point spread function, if you, if you had measured or characterized your point spread function, you could tell other people the behavior of your imaging system by reporting to them the full width half max. Uh, of the underlying point spread function. Uh, ultimately, you can define a different width, which just comes from integrating that point spread function and dividing by its maximum. So different ways of taking a, a point spread function that has some shape to it and reporting out a single value, either the full width half max, or on the bottom case here, a box function that's equivalent uh, in, in height and, and area uh, to the point spread function of your system. So the question is, how do we determine the point spread function h of x? We know that this relationship exists. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can just set the underlying object itself to be a delta function. And in doing so, the underlying, what we recover is that uh, the image that we would reconstruct would just be equivalent to the point spread function. Well, we know what the underlying image looks like from the, the slides that we had just a second ago, of the Fourier reconstruction uh, example. So in the case of, of having a delta function as the underlying object, we can recover just the point spread function. And the point spread function itself is just uh, the sum of the different spatial frequencies and their appropriate amplitudes. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, uh, this is the equivalence relation uh, here, uh, which says that the point spread function just comes from the sum of the different uh, spatial frequencies that we sample. And we'll look specifically at what this really says about the underlying point spread function. But this is the, uh, the way in which you could characterize the point spread function for, say, the experiment that you just uh, obtained. 
So what does it mean? Well, uh, if we go this expression here, it, it can be simplified into something that looks like this, uh, this Duralec uh, function. So this is all carried out in the Latimer book. We don't care about the, the, the every detail of it. It'll lead to some concluding points that is what we really care about in just a second. So for Fourier reconstruction, this is how we reconstruct all of our data in this class of, for MR. The point spread function itself is closely related to the Dreklet function. And the Dreklet function has a couple variables that we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, we can plot out this Dreklet function. If you look at it, it just looks like a sine over sine function. So it's sort of like a sync like uh, function itself. And this is the example of plotting out that function for, say, n points, where n points means how, how many points in k space that I acquire. What's my k space matrix size? And that's going to have a one-to-one -one mapping to the number of pixels. So in this case, I think of n equals 16 as being low resolution. Uh, normally, we have to have you know, 128 or 256 pixels to be highly resolved. And we just take the delta k to just pick it as unit. So this is a plot of what the direct light function looks like when we choose n to be 16 uh, in this function here, and we choose delta k to be 1. So what happens when we change parameters? Well, Here's an example of uh, keeping the same number of points, but changing delta k to two. What happens, what does it mean to have changed delta k by two? What happened to my field of view? My field of view went, went by half. So what happened to my pixel size? So I had a field of view that was specified by delta k, and I was encoding 16 points. That's the top example. And now I said, I'm going to cut delta k, I'm going to increase delta k to 2. Increasing delta k meant my field of view got cut in half. But I didn't change the number of encoding points. So is my resolution higher or lower? Higher. Smaller pixels, higher. And you see that here. So a plot of the direct let function, if we characterize this by the full width half max, the full width half max of this thing is narrower. So this is a higher resolution imaging system now only because I changed the field of view, right? So we look at other examples. So here's another example. Now I've said, I kept my delta K the same. I kept my field of view the same, that's fine. But now I've increased the number of encoding points. I've gone all the way up to 64 encoding points. What happened to the full width half max of my point spread function? It went down and it went down by something close to a factor of four. And I can do that similarly for the last example here, which is the combination of the two. I've increased the number of points I'm going to sample. This is the number of K points I'm going to sample, but it has a one-to-one -one mapping to the number of pixels I'm going to be able to reconstruct. And I've also changed my field of view. So now I end up with a really sharp point spread function, right? So I can have very, very sharp point spread functions with Fourier imaging, but it just means that I have to have a lot of sample points and small fields of view. Okay, that's, that, that may or may not be a problem for the experiment that you're trying to do, but that's the requirement. Uh, so uh, the Fourier reconstruction point spread function looks, ends up looking something like this. We can measure the, the width of that point spread function. And if we integrate uh, what we had just a second ago, that direct let function over the, the limits of integration that specify uh, the, the field of view or the period, then we'll get something that just looks like 1 over n delta k. And this is a good relationship to remember. This is what we call the Fourier pixel size. And so what does this look like? Well, what's 1 over delta k? We've got to remember that one. 1 over delta k is the same as our field of view, right? So this expression here is just field of view divided by the number of encoding points. Okay? So I've got a field of view of 250 millimeters. I've got 250 points I'm going to encode. Now my resolution or my Fourier pixel size is just going to be 250 divided by 250. I'll have one millimeter of spatial resolution. So this is sort of a you know a roundabout way of saying effectively that the Fourier sampling uh, scheme that we have has a really good point spread function, meaning uh, the Fourier pixel size is what we want it to be. It's very very it's basically there were some approximations in here, but it's basically identical to the field of view divided by the number of encoding. And that's a good thing. A bad imaging system would require you to, you know, to oversample. You have to acquire, say, a lot of points for the same field of view to get the resolution that you really wanted. And we don't have that case here. We, we cover very well the image of the underlying object for the field of view, the number of encoding points that we've specified. 
And so uh, this is just another, another way of drawing that together, how uh, the full width half max of our imaging system, or, or this way of characterizing the point spread function is just equivalent to the field of view divided by the total number of encoding points. So this has some not surprising, but interesting implications. It means that what we, in principle, what you want to do is reduce the, the, the full width half max, right? Or the width of your point spread function. We want to have nice tight point spread functions because that means we have really high, uh, the capability of really high resolution imaging. But we can't reduce this WH and reduce N simultaneously, okay? Not surprising, but if we want higher resolution, narrower widths, then we have to increase N. So ideally we want this to be small, then according to this relationship, N has to go up and up and up. So you have some choices. You can, you can get an increase in spatial resolution, uh, but that requires an increase in N or an increase in delta K. And an increase in delta K is equivalent to a decrease in the field. So this is a very sort of, uh, um, uh, sort of technical way of saying things that shouldn't be surprising to you. Meaning if I increase my field of view, I should, get a, I should have a lower resolution image. I can decrease my field of view and get a higher resolution image if I keep the number of encoding points constant. Alternately, I could fix my field of view and I could ch change the number of encoding points to go up for higher resolution or down for lower resolution. This is just the, the formalism for how we see that actually happen. So here's uh, just some uh, cartoon examples, if you will. Uh, what's the full, what's the, so the full width half max or the width of my uh, point spread function? Well, it's one over N delta KX. Uh, that's equivalent to field of view divided by number of encoding points. I can pick my field of view and I can pick my field of view such that it covers my object. If I only encode a, a small number of K points and I do a Fourier uh, reconstruction of this data, I'll recover an image of my object, but it'll be pixelated. I won't have a lot of imaging information because I didn't sample a lot of those S of N coefficients. I only got you know, maybe 100 coefficients. Alternately, I can sample a lot of K points uh, and uh, the full width half max of this system will be quite a bit smaller because while my field of view is held constant, the number of encoding points has gone up by a factor of three or four or something like that. And now the Fourier reconstruction of this imaging information, adding up all of these spatial frequencies with their appropriate amplitudes, gives me a, a much sharper image. Okay, so let's uh, continue to link this up with uh, other things that we specify, like our field of view. There's a couple things uh, that fall out of what we call the sampling theorem. And one is we can state that a space signal, meaning a signal that varies over space, uh, that we call a g of x, we call it a space-limited signal if your g of x is zero outside of your field of view. That just means that you have a finite object and the extent of that object is inside of the field of view that you specified. So everything falls in slot inside of your field of view. And then you have a so-called space-limited signal. And that's typical of the imaging experiments that we do. Uh, if your field of view is not appropriately sized, then you'll fall into this aliasing regime where those Fourier replicants will fold back into your, your image and that will create artifacts for you that you don't want. So we are, we're always good about specifying your field of view appropriately. Another consideration is, uh, is that a space signal, again, G of X, is band limited if the frequency spectrum is zero for some K greater than some K max. And that just means that outside of, a, of, a, of some frequency range that we care about, the information is, low, no, is either zero or sort of in some sense no longer important to us, meaning we can acquire and get up to the spatial frequencies that we want. And outside of that, uh, they don't contribute to, to either the experiment that we want to perform or in fact, maybe they are uh, zero uh, physically. So uh, G of X is space limited, uh, if rather G of X is space limited to be, uh, to fall within our field of view, while also being band limited to fall within this, uh, below a certain K max, then we have uh, this definition for our Delta X, which is our, basically our pixel size. And we saw this just a second ago. So our Delta X is just one over N Delta K. Uh, that gives us a pixel size. Uh, for a given K max, and the K max that we don't choose the K max on the scanner, what we choose is N and the field of view. And that tells us how far out into K space we need to go to get all the 
spatial frequencies for the resolution that we're interested in taking. And so these relationships sort of taken together, this first one should, should be no surprise that the field of view, this is just the width of the imaging domain. It's just the number of pixels times the pixel width, right? So that's just adding up all the pixels across the image. That's sort of a geometric relationship, if you will. And then we can insert back in here, if we know what the, uh, if we know these relationships here and how they relate back to say K max uh, and Delta KX, uh, we can come back to uh, recognizing that the field of view is again, just one over Delta KX. So we talked about having these Fourier replicants, and this is just another way of sort of seeing that same, same thing. The object itself, or the image, I should say, of the object itself repeats. It repeats because that Fourier summation series repeats. We're adding up a bunch of, uh, of Fourier signals that just extend over space and time. But we, we know, or we expect, that the signal is going to be space-limited. Uh, it's space-limited to the field of view that we care about. And therefore, we just truncate effectively this whole signal space just down to the field of view that we actually care about. So mathematically, we could reconstruct the sort of Fourier replicates, but they're not that interesting to us. So uh, when we do the final reconstruction, we only concern ourselves with this middle uh, object, if you will, image of the underlying object. Um, it's good to go back and think about how uh, the field of view and delta K is actually related to the gradients that we apply. Um, and so if we think about delta KX, we usually, we usually take the X direction to be the readout direction. So we're reading out along X and we're phase encoding along Y. It's just a convention of sorts. Uh, we've seen it you know, sort of described in two or three different ways that delta KX is specified by one over the field of view is something that we choose. So while this is the parameter that we choose, behind the scenes, the scanner has to do something very specific to achieve that field of view. Uh, for a given gyromagnetic ratio, uh, the field of view is gonna be governed by the magnitude of the readout gradient and the GX gradient and the delta time, the amount of time we sort of spend at that uh, position in case space. And this together governs uh, the, uh, the delta KX, which then in turn dictates what the actual field of view is going to be. So these are the field of view constraints during the readout. And if you look at the units of what's happening here, this is units of gradient area, right? So it's, it's gradient magnitude times gradient duration. And you see something similar when you look at the field of view direction. The relationship still holds that delta ky is governed by one over the field of view, the thing that we actually choose. And then in terms of uh, uh, how you get a particular delta ky, uh, we use the phase encoding gradient a little bit differently. We increment the phase encode amplitude itself and usually keep it on for a fixed amount of time uh, that we call the phase encoding uh, gradient duration. So here again, we still have the same units, gradient, amp gradient amplitude times time, uh, and that again specifies our delta ky, which is dictated by the field of view we chose. That's mostly the same. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll take a short break and then I'll come back and try to uh, talk to you guys about uh, zero padding and Gibbs ringing, I think, are the two things. We'll see how far we get. Let's take a, maybe a five minute break. Seven. And then when you put something that is 40, so you can look at the like the gels in there. 
So I know that was a it was a pretty short break, but I think everyone sort of come back. Um, I'm feeling the I'm feeling the pressure at the end of the quarter, right? There's still so much I want to share. We gotta we just gotta try to make it there. So uh, we'll see what we get through as usual. I'll get through sort of as, as much of this as is reasonable. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that Eric will come, uh, you know, relatively soon, so he can field some questions if you have any about the lab or if you have questions about the homework that's that's due. He says he's been getting a fair number of questions just kind of here and there, email and office hours, and that's great. So take advantage of getting help from those guys. Uh, that being said, there's not so much time left. Uh, okay, so hopefully we understand at least conceptually that the way that we recover the image of our object is by adding up a bunch of uh, spatial frequency encoding terms with their appropriate amplitude. We have to know those amplitudes, and that's what MR does. It lets us sample the amplitudes of those different spatial frequency encoding terms. When it comes to actually imaging, for different reasons, uh, we are limited, right? We went from having infinite limits on our integral to, or infinite limits on our sum to having finite limits on our sum that said we were just going to map out a certain uh, n number of points, capital N number of points, because uh, in some sense we're limited in time, if nothing else, to how much data we can acquire. As a, as a consequence of being li limited in how much data we can acquire, sometimes n is small. Uh, and if you look carefully at those expressions, we dealt with them just in, in one direction, one, one dimension, if you will, just summing up over the n direction. In principle, we have to sum up over the n and maybe the m direction for spatial frequency terms that map us out through all of kx and all of ky. The downside of this whole sampling scheme is that we can't always acquire the number of k points or the amplitudes for the underlying k points. We can't get as many of them as we want. Uh, and that leads to uh, some considerations in how we ultimately reconstruct all of the data. One possibility is so-called zero padding. Uh, zero padding is basically saying you have a bunch of Fourier coefficients, and uh, if we do a, if we do a, a Fourier transform of those Fourier coefficients, uh, the resulting image will have the same number of, of entries as the case space array. Right? There's a one-to-one -one mapping between the number of k points I have and the number of pixels I reconstruct. Well, sometimes you want more pixels, right? If nothing else, it'll just help you understand the geometry or something like this of your underlying object. And that's where zero padding sort of enters in. So why do we want to zero pad? What's the, what's, the, what's the reason for zero padding? Well, in principle, all we do is append zeros to case space data before we do the Fourier transform. So you can do this with the part dot map data that you have for homework three. Uh, Principally, you want to append it symmetrically about k space. So you don't want to move where things are in k space. You just want to put zeros on, say, either side of k space, top, bottom, or left, right. Why do you want a zero pad? Well, there's a, there's a few reasons. Uh, the Fourier transform is so widely used in, in digital signal processing that there are fast Fourier transforms and there are sort of relatively routine Fourier transforms. Uh, if your n is 2 to the n, then you can use what's called the radix 2 fast Fourier transform, and it's super fast. So if you have to do a million Fourier transforms, it's nice if your data is, is 2 to the n in its total number of data points. So if capital N is 2 to the n. Uh, 
Um, this effectively increases your digital resolution. You'll see this as a, as a specification if you go buy a digital camera, right? It'll talk about having a 3x optical zoom and a, you know, a 4x or 4,000x digital zoom, right? Digital zooming is just signal processing. Zero padding is one way of doing that. It can be a, a genuinely useful thing. I'll show you in just a second because it'll help you reconstruct data with the right aspect ratio. We've talked about pixel size in some of the previous spatial resolution slides, and our pixel dimensions are actually independently controlled for, say, the X direction and the Y direction. And that means the pixel dimensions in MR don't have to be equal. You can have pixels that are rectangular, you have very rectangular pixels. But that's not always a very uh, useful thing because all of the displays that we have are all square pixels. Any monitor, this display, this display, your phone, your laptop, whatever, they all use square pixels. So if you acquire data with rectangular pixels, but you reconstruct it with square pixels, you'll have this geometric sort of mashing. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. So zero padding is, is, a, is a useful thing, but you have to use a little bit cautiously because you're not really adding any information, right? You've only added zeros after all, but it might do something useful for you. So let's look at some examples. Um, here I have just a 64 by 64 array of K point uh, magnitudes. And a Fourier transform of those recovers this kind of small image that's shown on the bottom there. Uh, I can zoom in just by stretching it uh, by a factor of, say, three or four in both directions. And I can see that my image is really, you know, it's kind of blocky and kind of pixelated. So now I have, you know, dozens of pixels representing an actual pixel. And it looks kind of boxy, but, you know, maybe that's okay. It's possible that I could, uh, because of, say, time constraints, I may only acquire half of the Fourier data. If I acquire half of the Fourier data, I can do that about half of the time because I don't need as many phase encode steps. So I didn't go as far out in K space for, say, this acquisition here. And I only have 32 KY code points, and I still have 64, say, in the left right direction. Yeah, what this means is my delta K was the same, the way I've shown it here. My delta K was the same, so my field of view was the same. But I didn't go as far out in, in terms of spatial resolution. Right? If I didn't go out as far in spatial resolution, then the dimensions of my pixels in this up-down direction must be coarser than the dimensions of my pixels in my left-right direction. And if I directly Fourier transform this K matrix, I'll end up getting something that looks like this. Don't worry about the smearing artifact, but just focus on the idea that the geometric representation of this uh, object has been squashed. Right? It's been squashed because the number of pixels in this array is equivalent to the number of pixels in this array. But the problem was my encoding scheme was such that my pixels were actually rectangular. So there's a simple way to get past this problem and it's just through zero padding. I can fake out my K matrix with a bunch of zero points, then apply the 2D Fourier transform and recover a new object of my underlying, or new image of my underlying object that looks more like this. And what you'll notice if you look carefully, it's a little hard to see, but if you look at like this pixel right here at the end of the mouse pointer, it's rectangular, right? It's twice as tall as it is wide. So this zero padding lets us basically stretch out every pixel according to its real dimensionality. Uh, so that now we have more, we have a better geometric match between our underlying, our image of our underlying object through zero padding. We wouldn't really want to look at or diagnose off of an image that was geometrically squashed. But just by zero padding, we can recover the right aspect ratio. So that's one useful reason to include zero padding, uh, uh, to, to go to zero padding. So uh, I sort of mix up the examples here. Here I was saying if I just actually stretched it, I would recover this image. Uh, the other option is to actually zero pad it. And if I zero pad it, you can see that those same pixels now are individually square. So just by stretching, I have rectangular pixels, and that might not be preferred. By zero padding, I've, I've added, I haven't added any information, but they'll show up as coefficients in that Fourier sum uh, such that my pixels themselves will now be square again. And that might be a, a more useful thing. Uh, we'll talk about some of these other artifacts and, and problems that you're seeing in this reconstructed image in just a second. So bottom line, zero padding is useful for reconstructing pixels as square. Um, one of the artifacts that you'll notice in these recovered uh, images here 
is what we call Gibbs ringing. And so you'll see these sort of uh, the sort of ripple artifact that's especially in the up down direction of these images. Uh, so I want to introduce that concept and talk about how we how we get away from it. And it's it's basically a it's an artifact of discrete sampling uh, called Gibbs ringing. So uh, we saw it in those images just a second ago, you get this spurious ringing typically around sharp edges, where sharp means you have a big signal intensity discontinuity or difference. So if you have high contrast objects, you're susceptible to Gibbs ringing. Uh, mathematically, it can, it can only overshoot by about 9% of the intensity discontinuity. But oftentimes in objects, we have like zero for background because it's just air, for example. And then we might have a very high signal intensity right at, say, the surfaces of the body because they're typically uh, fatty tissues that have really bright signals. So you could get a pretty big Gibbs ringing artifact if you don't work with your data appropriately. Uh, it's, it's basically independent of the number of reconstruction points. And the frequency of that ringing, that sort of banding artifact that you see, increases as the number of recon points increases. And that's actually a good thing, right? That means that if we can increase the number of reconstruction points through zero padding, for example, we can make that ringing become less and less apparent. So we want to squash that Gibbs ringing, if you will. There's two different ways of doing that. It really results from truncating the Fourier series model. Remember the sum that we're using is a finite sum from minus n over two to plus n to big n, the total sample points. So it arises as a consequence of finite sampling. There's different ways you could reduce it. One is to acquire more data, but that's expensive, so to speak, right? It takes more time, it takes more whatever to acquire more data. So that's not always uh, possible. Another option is actually to filter your data, which can reduce the oscillations. Uh, you'll see these oscillations in the point spread function in just a second. And we can push this Gibbs ringing down and, and deal with it in a pretty acceptable way. So uh, here uh, we can use, uh, I forget what the function in MATLAB is called that lets you generate these Shep Logan uh, images. I think it's just called Phantom or something like that. But you can generate these uh, these objects relatively easily in MATLAB and then just take a 2D Fourier transform and you get something that looks like this. So let's look at what happens when we only have certain elements of that same Fourier space. So we may just have, for example, the central 32 by 32 array of K points all the way up to having a full 256 by 256 array. And depending on how we've specified our imaging protocol, we could be acquiring any of these other sort of possible uh, case space uh, arrays. So if we chose, uh, if we chose this example, or maybe this example here, we're still getting the full resolution, say, in the readout direction, but we've opted to not get as many uh, points in the up-down direction. What's this going to do to the resolution of our image? Increase or decrease? Decrease. What's it going to do to our field of view? Increase or decrease? Nothing, right? It's not going to, we haven't changed delta k, so our field of view is actually the same. All we've done is taken out the number of lines, how far out of the k space we went, so it'll affect our resolution. So by pulling out different sort of blocks of k space here, we can just do a 2D Fourier transform and recover the underlying object. The underlying objects would look something like this. This is a geometric distortion uh, that we saw before if, because we've encoded our, our pixels to not be square. They're, they can be very rectangular in the case of having missed a lot of sample points along the x direction or missed a lot of sample points along the y direction. We don't have high spatial frequency information. We have these chunky pixels. Zero padding can bring that back in terms of its geometric fidelity, right? So we can add a bunch of zeros back into our k array. But what that reveals or uncovers for us is that uh, we have really significant Gibbs ringing, right? So you can see the Gibbs ringing artifact is substantial, say, in this image in particular in the up-down direction. Uh, and it's sort of the opposite in this top right corner, the left-right direction. And the reason the Gibbs ringing is uh, sort of directional in that sense has to do with the direction that we undersampled it. Did we undersample in the left-right direction or did we undersample in the up-down direction? The Gibbs ringing effectively goes away as you increase the, the spatial resolution, right? In this case, we have full Fourier sampling and we don't see any apparent Gibbs ringing. So this is a nice option if you have the time to acquire all of that data, but sometimes you only have the time to acquire this data or this data, and the Gibbs ring will be really apparent. So what can we, what can we do about it, do anything about it? Uh, one option is through so-called windowed reconstruction. So 
the reconstruction framework that I've shown you so far was just adding up you know, the weights that we measured, multiplied on the spatial frequency encoding term, add them all up, and we'll get recover the image itself. But we can do one small thing to change all of that. Uh, this was our Fourier reconstruction uh, equation that we had from, you know, maybe half an hour ago. Uh, we can introduce the idea of windowed reconstruction just by, just by adding in a, this windowing function here. What this means here is you have a weight, W, uh, w sub n, meaning the weight is different depending on the n that you're acquiring. Remember, n marches us through different discrete points in k-space. So depending on where we are in k-space or which point we're trying to acquire, we can update or change what this windowing uh, weight will be. And this will give us what we call a windowed Fourier reconstruction. This is very commonly done on any of the systems uh, that we have, any manufacturer, and there's a little bit of uh, sort of uh, industrial magic or secret sauce that goes into the windowing functions that they apply. We can usually figure it out by looking at their data, but they don't always tell us what it is. Okay, so let's go back to this, uh, this idea here that the image itself is the convolution of the underlying object in the point spread function. Uh, we can set this to a delta function we know, and then we could recover what is the point spread function, in this case, for a windowed Fourier reconstruction. And the only thing we see that's new is this windowing function pictures in here. So it's just an amplitude that acts also on that spatial frequency encoding term. In the, con in the case of the conventional reconstruction, the windowing function is just ones. Right? It's just one for all ends. But we can be more creative than that and do something interesting. So this is the example of what's called a Hamming filter. And the Hamming filter uh, is sort of this Gauss-like uh, function that's described up here as a, as a uh, sort of based off of a cosine function. Uh, there are also Hamming filters with two ends. I don't know why there's a Hamming filter and a Hamming filter. Uh, in fact, they're very similar in terms of their, their appearance and their numerically, they're very similar, not identical, but similar. But the bottom line is this windowing function is going to be full amplitude for for uh, n, little n equals zero. That's your middle k point, right? So this means that your middle k space point will not be affected by this windowing function. You're just multiplying by one. And as you move off to the left of k space, or you move off to the right of k space, you're going to be pushing down the amplitude of that thing that you sample. And this will have the effect of resolving that Gibbs ringing because it changes fundamentally the point spread function uh, of, the, of the window Fourier reconstruction. And so the full with half max point spread function for that Hamming windowed Fourier reconstruction ends up looking like this. And we don't need to work through the steps and we don't even really have to uh, be mindful of, of exactly how we landed at this point. Uh, the point is that the Hamming windowed Fourier reconstruction can suppress this underlying ringing, uh, but it does effectively reduce the spatial resolution. So this, uh, this windowing, this window weight term that shows up here it's going to effectively broaden. It's going to be greater than one. And it's going to broaden the point spread function of your imaging system. So uh, you could push down the Gibbs ringing, but you sacrifice something with regards to spatial resolution. Fortunately, the penalty is pretty small. And so here we have, uh, this is the Fourier uh, recon point spread function. And if you convolve it with what I'll call the true object, just some box-like function, then you recover something that looks pretty well like your underlying object, but it has some ringing that's associated with it. And when you have large step changes in your signal intensity, right, your object is really bright and adjacent is relatively dark, then you'll get these ringing artifacts. This is the, uh, a line profile through an area that would have substantial Gibbs ringing. And the overshoot here, again, will never be more than 9% of the signal difference between the maximum amplitude and the minimum amplitude. The nice thing is the Hamming weighted point spread function looks like this. It has a lot less ringing because you've effectively multiplied this point spread function by that Gauss filter that I showed you a second, which multiplied point wise. So you end up with a Hamming weighted point spread function convolved with your underlying object then you get something that looks a lot smoother. There's no overshoots, there's no ringing, that Gibbs ringing has been suppressed. But if you measured the full width half max of, of, the, of the point spread function itself, it would be broader. You can maybe make it out if you compare the two point spread functions uh, on top and on bottom. So it's a pretty good trade-off and it's widely used. Meaning we can suppress the Gibbs ringing, give up a little bit of spatial resolution, 10%, something like that, and get an image that has uh, substantially improved overall image quality.
Uh, in two dimensions, the handling filter just looks something like this. So we can choose, this is just an outer product or a dyadic product. So here you have, a, uh, you have that weight function that looked like a Gaussian, but I'm just gonna multiply it by a Gaussian in the other direction. And so you end up with something that, this is just a 2D handling filter. It has the same line pro profile across the middle here as that orange curve I showed you a second ago. And it has that same profile up down across the middle here as well. So they're just multiplying those two one dimensional filters together. And all we're going to do is multiply this point wise on K space. So that's all we need to do. We can design our filter to be a Hamming filter, multiply this on K space, reduce Gibbs ringing, and compromise the spatial resolution just a little bit. <laughs> so if this is our 2D Fourier data, and we just do a direct Fourier transform of it, we get a relatively coarse object. And we also see substantial Gibbs ringing. Some other artifacts, don't worry about those right now, but you definitely see Gibbs ringing. If we take the same Fourier data, case-based data, uh, this really should just be not convolution, but point multiplication, right? It just entered in as a point multiplication. So this array dot multiplied in MATLAB speak, dot multiply this onto your Fourier data, gives you windowed Fourier data. And your windowed Fourier data after reconstruction will give you this image of your underlying object. And I think we would all agree that we'd rather be you know, measuring or interpreting something off of this image, even if it's slightly lower in spatial resolution uh, than we would off of this image here. So Hamming filtering and 2D windowed Fourier reconstructions are uh, the, the mainstay of uh, image recall for Cartesian, well, for anything. Okay, so this was the zero pad example that we had just a second ago. And uh, when we do zero padding, it really makes more apparent in some sense the underlying Gibbs ringing. And depending on what the underlying Fourier sampling pattern was, we see Gibbs ringing, say, up down, or we see the Gibbs ringing running left, right. That's what zero padding. If we do zero padding, but we add that Hamming weighted filter, then we end up with something like this. Uh, obviously, the Gibbs ringing is, is effectively gone in all of these images at the compromise of some spatial resolution. So this image will be the sharpest. It's the most fully sampled. But some of these other images, I mean, this is half the amount of data, so to speak, right? Because I only had half as many uh, KX points, but this is half as many KY points. Pretty hard to distinguish these images from this image. And this image would take at least twice as long to acquire. So there are some really nice ways to undersample your data, filter it in useful ways, and still recover a really good representation of the underlying object. Okay, so that's a uh, that's wrap for today uh, in terms of uh, what I'll cover for image reconstruction. We'll come back to a little bit of this in, the, uh, in my last two lectures, which will both be next week. Um, we saw Eric walked in just a few minutes ago, so I'll hand back the um, the laboratories now. You guys can look those over. Uh, the average was 8.8 .8 plus or minus 0.9, so it was pretty smooth in that sense. Um, Eric, I don't know if you want to make any general comments or. Okay. So he's he's here if you have questions about uh, about any of that. Uh, Um, 
if you want to know a sort of general standing in the class at this point, you've got two of the homeworks back, the lab back. Uh, just let me know. I can sort of tell you where, you know, I don't know where things land until the very end of the class, but I can give you a good sense. There is a considerable number of you already that have more than 100% of the points, right? So, so the, the, the grade, the class is generally curved, but there's a lot of people that are in the 95 to 102 or 3 percent range. So it's, gonna be, uh, it's not going to be heavily curved. Uh, but bottom line, if you're worried, concerned, have questions about your standing in a class, just email me and I'll, and I'll clarify and we can be if we need to. Okay? Uh, and then lab is one more. We've got lab next week. Next week. So. Question? Okay, cool. So Eric's here if you have questions about the lab, how it's graded or anything like that, uh, or about the upcoming homework assignment. There might be a class coming at 3 o'clock, so be mindful if people start showing up that we should clear out. And if you have questions for me, I'm still around for the little Okay.